Hi, this is Amy Proal with the PolyBio Podcast, and my guest today is Dr. Diane Griffin. She's the Alfred and Jill Summer Professor and Chair in the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she's also a Professor of Infectious Diseases of Neurology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And her team studies RNA viruses, such as alpha viruses and measles virus, virus in order to clarify the mechanisms by which they interact with the host immune system. And importantly, her lab also studies the persistence of these RNA viruses. In other words, they study the mechanisms by which a range of RNA viruses or their genetic material, their RNA backbones, can persist in host tissue or body fluids over long periods of time after the resolution of acute infection. And this knowledge is very important for the study of long COVID since a growing number of studies have found SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein in patient samples months after initial illness. So with that, Diane, thank you so much for coming okay, out. You're welcome. Great. So Diane, I did mention that for years now, you have been studying RNA or RNA persistence. And what we mean by that then is I think people are familiar with the DNA viruses that can persist, like the herpes viruses. People understand that if they get herpes, unfortunately, they have it for life. The virus remains in their body and can go in and out of states of latency. But what you've studied is how RNA viruses can also um, basically cause long-term or persist in the body in a, in a long-term capacity as well. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Right, so the, it was kind of surprising to find this. We didn't expect to. <laughs> we had, uh, we like everybody else thought that, you know, if yeah. you have a, an acute disease and uh, you get sick and you either live or you die and then, once you are uh, recovered, uh, then that's it <laughs> for these types of infections. And we first discovered uh, that that wasn't the case um, when we were studying alpha viruses, as, as you mentioned, and they cause encephalitis or infection of the nervous system. And they mainly infect neurons. And so neurons are very long lived cells. And so we became very interested in how in the world you could possibly recover from a virus infection of neurons without killing the neurons and making everything worse. Uh, <clears throat> because that's the usual mechanism that the immune system uses to get rid of virus infected cells. And, uh, but if the cell doesn't, especially if the cell doesn't die uh, due to the infection and Actually, most cells don't usually, even though in, in tissue culture where we study them, they often do die when they're infected with viruses. But cells in, in uh, animals and in people, <laughs> et cetera, often have lots of mechanisms for uh, staying alive. And so if you stay alive, then uh, the immune system has to get rid of, either get rid of the cells or somehow get rid of the virus itself and the genetic uh, material. So we first discovered that this wasn't happening uh, in the nervous system, because again, as I say, the neuron is kind of a special cell. Uh, well, many other cells, you can make new ones all the time. You can't make new neurons uh, very easily. And for the most part, we don't. The ones we have are the ones we're gonna have. Uh, so so in, as a part of trying to understand how the immune system could actually lead to recovery from these infected neurons, uh, we uh, looked not only at the ability to recover the virus from the brains of, these are mice, the, all our studies for this kind of thing, I've been in mice, uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, long after that, uh, you could still find the RNA. And partly this was a, a, well, it's not a brand new finding at this point, but at the time that we were doing it, it was a uh, really new ability to easily detect RNA for viruses uh, using the reverse transcriptase PCR uh, uh, approaches, which are very sensitive. Uh, 
So, uh, <clears throat> and then we discovered that the RNA actually didn't go away. And it, it, it decreased over time slightly, but it was over months. Mm -hmm. and, and actually you could continue to detect it in most mice uh, for a year or two, and that's all the longer a mouse lives. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically for life, uh, and then we discovered that that led to a persistence of um, the immune response, basically, in the brain. That uh, particularly, we've been particularly interested in antibody, but particularly um, cells that make antibody go into the brain at the time of the original infection, but then, then they stay and they keep making antibody again for the life of the, of the, of the mouse. And, and the mouse is perfectly okay, uh, has recovered entirely, but all this is still going on in the, in the brain. So that was the original observation and, and we've done a fair number of things looking at what's actually going on with antibody, et cetera. But as you also mentioned, we study measles. <clears throat> Well, so measles doesn't, well, it can infect the brain, but that's not its usual uh, thing. <laughs> it usually, you know, causes a rash and, and infects the skin and, and it infects um, actually the uh, lymph nodes uh, are a very important place for a measles uh, virus to replicate. And we were studying measles, in, in, but we never thought all those cells turn over. So it never occurred to us that measles might also have some persistent RNA because those cells, you could the immune system could eliminate and you would just make more of them. That wouldn't be a problem. Uh, and then we were studying children in, in Zambia. And at that time, uh, there was a lot of HIV infection in, uh, uh, in, in Zambia and including in, in children. And so we were, interested in, in whether they were, they were recovering, those children were recovering as well as children who didn't have uh, HIV. And so we were just looking at, I don't know, respiratory secretions, urine, blood, to where, just where you find measles. Mm -hmm. And at, you know, a month, and then we found, and this was a month after they were discharged from the hospital. So again, they're well and uh, running around. And uh, so we found that in almost half of them, we were still finding the measles virus RNA. And that, uh, <clears throat> that led to uh, uh, say, well, well, we'll bring them back at three months. So certainly by three months, they uh, will have cleared all this uh, RNA. Uh, but that wasn't true. They were still a large proportion, you know, half of them perhaps, and we didn't do very extensive sampling, were still positive for this RNA. And it didn't matter whether they had HIV infection or not. It was clearly a part of the normal recovery from measles independent of whether they also were infected with uh, HIV. And so that is sort of the overall context. And, and as I say, we were surprised. We weren't looking for that. We didn't, even though we had already made the observations in the brains of the mice, we didn't. And then we got very interested in what all that RNA might continue to be doing <laughs> for yes. the long term in, in both of these contexts. Wow. It's so interesting because I would have to say so many teams just don't, we don't check. It's one of the things that, no. that is interesting when it comes to this RNA persistence is that very few people just go ahead and do what you did and say, let's actually keep looking for it in people who've had measles or let's let's look for the genetic material. There's such a dearth of, of teams that have done that, that it is such a breakthrough when you actually went ahead and just just check to see if it was there. Yeah, yeah so I'm I'm totally convinced that if any that this is true for most acute okay. RNA virus infections and you just have to look. That also makes sense to me, because when you look at the literature, there, there are teams that have done this. And if, if you actually, I'm sure as you know, for example, we study a condition called myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, or MECFS. And there's one researcher who's found enterovirus RNA and antigen in, in, several, in 
two repeated cohorts of patients with that, with that uh, condition in the intestinal tissue, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just, again, the, the whole, exactly how much does that contribute to the disease process? We need further study. But there are all these examples of different papers and teams that do find RNA virus, uh, RNA um, and antigen in different studies. And if you start to bring those together, I agree, it does seem like most of these viruses are at least capable of right. um, persisting in an, in an RNA state. But right. that then does bring up this, this question, right? So when we're talking about we, when we're talking about some of the RNA viruses, like the hepatitis viruses, which people are pretty familiar with as being more persistent, mm -hmm. when the RNA remains of that virus, people are still infectious. In other words, right. they can still pass the virus to others. Right. But it seems that with some of these viruses, the enteroviruses or the measles, that virus that you're studying, you right. have the RNA that continues to remain in at least some cells or, right. or, or uh, you know, depending anatomical type sanctuaries, in, in other words, areas where the immune system may not recognize them so much. And, and then, but people don't seem to be infectious. They don't seem to pass it anymore. Right. And so that we have this sort of intermediate state right. of RNA and, and what's what a number of teams that I've talked to, I mean, the, the sort of common perception is, well, it doesn't matter then, it's just RNA, it doesn't right. really matter. And I, I was, it seems like it does. I, it right. does seem that even if it's just RNA and, and people are not getting each other ill every time that they're talking to each other, that there's still consequences of this RNA. Would you go into that a little bit more? Yes, well, so, right, it, it's like there's a, well, I don't know if there's a continuum. I, I think actually the, the quotes clearance or the uh, of what we call infectious virus. So uh, something that you can actually recover that will infect another cell or infect another person. Uh, <clears throat> that is, uh, is usually cleared fairly quickly within a week or two, usually of the acute uh, infection. But uh, as I say, the RNA continues. So there have to, there need to be mechanisms and that's kind of the sorts of things that, that we and, and other people are studying is, um, is how, you, um, uh, how you quit producing that virus that is infectious, but still have the cell alive and have the RNA. And for the most part, I think it's not just RNA. I think that the RNA, and, and, and there are people that say, and particularly when we first published a lot of this, they, they, they said, well, it's just fragments. It's just uh, chewed up RNA and it's not doing anything. And so why do we care? And, uh, but it was clearly doing something to the immune system um, or stimulating the immune system. Because if we go back to our mice with the uh, RNA persistent in the neurons, the fact that B cells stay and produce antibody against that particular virus in the brain, and they're right in the areas of the, uh, of the persistent RNA, and there's T cells there as well, mm -hmm. making interferon gamma usually, but uh, it means the immune system, for the most part, doesn't care about RNA. They care about proteins that are actually, so that RNA is being translated uh, to make viral proteins. And as you mentioned in the beginning, there are uh, you know, studies that are showing um, for long COVID, which I think is mainly going to be the the disease that's going to help us to understand all this the best because we have so many people <laughs> with it and we at least know what the infection yep. was uh, so i think we have a better chance but that um that the uh the continued production of of protein that then stimulates the uh the immune system uh and and we've shown in the mouse studies that uh, if you and, and other people have as well. But if you suppress the immune response, then or are dealing with an animal that is not very immunocompetent, that the that the virus can come back. So mm -hmm. there's a whole whole genomes are in there. They may not be very much, but uh, right. but you can. Um, uh, it, replication and production of infectious virus can uh, 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 basically restart. 
That makes sense. Exactly. So we're, we're looking at these different possible forms of persistence potentially where in some cases you have infectious virus and that seems fairly clear. That might be more of a hepatitis type virus. Then you have sometimes the RNA persistence, but and it may not be infectious in a classical sense, right. but it's still translating. In other words, it's still active and it's still creating right. proteins. In other words, it's still quite frankly, acting like a virus um, right. as opposed to an inert piece of RNA. Um, yes. Right. And then those proteins or antigens uh, continue to stimulate or modulate the immune response. In other words, you're going to have T cells or B cells that are circulating through tissue and sites that have right. this, and they'll recognize that antigen and continue to signal or respond to it. And that can actually cause an immune response that might be tied to actually symptoms or problems in a patient. Right, right. And okay. if you think about the, um, the, the sort of transition from producing infectious virus to not producing infectious virus, but still having RNA and making protein, it's not hard to think about how uh, uh, antibody, uh, first of all, may uh, it, it neutralize or inactivate any virus that gets released or bind to the surface of a cell and prevent the virus from being released. And that that doesn't happen or you don't get that kind of antibody being made for hepatitis C virus, for instance, or, or some of these, or HIV, uh, some of these viruses where con people continue to be infectious for, yeah. uh, for other people. Uh, well, what we're mostly talking about is uh, of viruses where that's not the case that, uh, and that's usually established epidemiologically that right. they don't transmit any kind of infection to yeah. other people. Right, that makes sense. And, but then as you said, it seems like the RNA in some cases may be actually able to be infectious possibly. And I guess where I'm drawing for that is the yeah. post Ebola syndrome literature as of late where oh, yeah. right. we saw for a while exactly. that teams were finding Ebola RNA in what they were calling anatomical sanctuaries. So the eye tissue or other body sites, the testes, for example, that are have a less robust immune response might make it easier for the, the virus or the RNA to stick around. But then a new Ebola outbreak appears to have been started by a person who did seem capable of transmitting that RNA. Right. Um, or in other words, on the virus. and it <laughs> right. seems, I guess, that it was capable of being infectious, right? So I guess yeah. are, there are these gray areas then, would you say? Right. And, and, um, and the same thing happened with Zika virus, yeah. uh, uh, where there was, a, and in most of these cases, uh, the clearest is sexual transmission that's right. occurred, because the testes is a place where virus clearance seems to be less effective. And just like in, in the brain as well. Uh, and as you say, these have been thought to be anatomic sanctuaries. I, I mean, we know they're not. Uh, the immune system is active in those places, but it may not be as effective in, um, in being able to eliminate infected cells or, or whatever, it, because those places also have highly regulated local uh, immune responses to prevent pathology and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, the sexual transmission of Ebola and Zika, which have hurt, occurred many months after those people had uh, recovered. And as you say, and for Ebola, started a whole new outbreak in a new place. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so it has some importance also for epidemiology. Uh, that's Definitely. Good. That's what it seems like with, with the study of, of SARS-CoV-2 RNA and antigen persistence in long COVID does seem to have actually consequences for the entire pandemic. In other words, we've also seen, I'm not sure if you've seen studies where a severely immunocompromised patient who was treated for COVID in the hospital, for example, someone unfortunately with lymphoma yes. or someone on a lot right. of immunosuppressive medications, has been shown to be capable of harboring SARS-CoV-2 for a, a long oh, yeah. period of time. Right. And actually the virus is evolving new mutations in that patient. So then right. it, there do seem like instances right. in which it can still be quite problematic in a, in a persistent state. Oh yes. And, and so, but that's in an immunocompromised right. uh, person and yep. you're absolutely right. But I think some, you know, I mean, some these 
people that transmitted Ebola and Zika long afterwards were yeah. not immunocompromised or were not recognized yeah. to be immunocompromised at, at yeah. least. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, so one thing that I think is, is interesting when, when we're, you know, I'm a microbiologist and this is one of the topics that the research teams we work with, um, we have a nonprofit research organization. We actually try to study this topic and, and say, okay, um, can we find viral RNA or antigen in, in tissue samples from patients with various chronic conditions or, or things like that? One of the things that that's a challenge is when the viral, the RNA gets into the central nervous system. Um, in that case, not long ago, I would tell people, look, you know, there, there was, for example, an ME-CFS autopsy study where, and there haven't been many of them, where they found, um, again, a type of enterovirus RNA in the brainstem of a patient. And a lot of people said they can't be, the patient would, would die. In other words, if you had some RNA in, in glia and in the brain cells, that's, that's death. You, you wouldn't have a chronic state. And I, I think that people, I'm not sure about what you think, but that's, people are making two categorical uh, claims because I do understand that if, if the virus, a virus continued, an RNA virus continued to act like it did during acute illness, Yes, it, it might kill someone, but it's right. not doing that, right? So right. How, how do you think that we have this transition in the central nervous system towards, you know, we have these long lived immune cells and in the brain, especially, you think then that's, that's actually a, a prime site of, of reservoir, right? Oh yeah, right, okay. exactly. And as I said, if the virus doesn't kill the, uh, kill the neuron and the immune response can suppress the virus replication without eliminating it, then uh, the neurons, uh, or I don't know what cells, I don't know about the enterovirus uh, uh, studies, but um, you know what cells they're in. But, but measles, there's a, a late complication of measles uh, that actually does end up being a fatal disease, but it's a fatal disease over about over a decade. You know, this is not an acute uh, encephalitis. It's a gradual deterioration of the, of the function of the nervous system. Uh, but, um, but the cells, uh, you know, uh, are, are surviving for a fairly long time. And, and the nervous system is special in many ways, but one of them is that it, is, it connects one neuron to the other with synapses yeah. that actually can transport viruses across those, uh, those synapses. So the virus can have a way to spread. And that's true with epithelial cells too. They're very connected. Viruses can spread from one to the other without ever having to go out and in. Uh, and be exposed to antibody, et cetera, or uh, be transmitted. Um, yeah. So, no, and there are, there are quite a few examples, I think, of uh, persistent viruses that you can find in the nervous system. And, and in some cases, I mean, most people, most of the time you're not looking unless somebody's sick. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, the, uh, I, th I think there's a wide range of uh, possibilities. Uh, Agreed. You know, and I guess it goes a little into the whole thinking of what is a virus anyway, right? Where when people say it's just RNA or it's virus, and at a certain point, it's like, right, but what is RNA? You know, I mean, what it, it comes down to, you know, where some people think viruses are alive, should be considered alive, and some people think that they're not. Or, so in other words, it seems like we almost need to keep working as a community to sort of understand how we even want to define um, what it means to have RNA. Right. <laughs> that That isn't self. That right, exactly. Foreign, foreign, foreign RNA, RNA. And, how, and how you deal with that. And and some people think that the presence of the RNA, the, the main uh, effect of that is actually stimulating what we call the innate immune system to make cytokines and, and that sort of thing, rather than it's making proteins and stimulating uh, other aspects of the uh, immune response. And most thing, both things may be true because mm -hmm. we uh, the cells, the body does have ways of knowing that the RNA is or is not its own uh, mm -hmm. RNA and uh, 
and producing uh, responses to that. I think that in the things that we're talking about for the, these long persistence of viral RNA and a variety of sites, depending on where the virus was, the beginning, yeah. uh, that that it is, uh, we don't know exactly what state it is in, in the cell. And that's a, a topic, yeah. I think, an important topic for uh, for investigation. Okay. But, but it is in some kind of a protected state, yeah. uh, whether that's associated with lipid membranes or it's encapsulated or uh, it, it's somehow it is not getting, it's not getting degraded in the right. cell. It's not getting recognized sufficiently that it's foreign to get degraded because the cell does have ways of degrading RNA that doesn't oh. belong there. Uh, and that's not happening. Uh, or, you know, I think it is happening, but it's just not happening enough to get rid of all of it. <laughs> that makes sense. Basically, because when you when you look at any of these situations, whether it's measles or alpha viruses, there is a decline over time, uh, but then it kind of plateaus. Uh, and so it reaches some sort of equilibrium state, but, but the, the, the body is getting rid of it or clearing um, the RNA. Again, it's usually over, I mean, the pattern is that it's usually over two, three, four months uh, after apparent recovery um, that it declines, but then that decline may be very different from one person to another. I don't know where, you know. <laughs> that would seem to make sense because I think with SARS-CoV-2, it's, it's not a great thought, but it may be possible that a decent number of people still have some SARS-CoV-2 RNA mm -hmm. um, after they've had COVID, just like oh, you're yeah. talking about with measles and this and the people are at least taking some time to fully get rid of this, you know, RNA. But right. in some patients who develop the chronic symptoms, you name it, it may be that they already had uh, right. another genetic issue or a, a previous infection that's already modulating the immune response or difficulty right. and, and the RNA and antigen are able to act in a different way in that patient to be able to drive more symptoms. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This yeah. is biology after all. And right. we're very <laughs> heterogeneous populations of people that are getting infected. Um, yeah, so. because I think that's important because for example, even with the herpes viruses for a while in chronic disease, there were some people who would argue, well, everyone has herpes viruses. So how much can they matter in, in disease? And it's like, well, no, they, they obviously must be acting. It's not really always about if it's just there, it's also about what it's doing. So the right. RNA may be doing something differently in people with chronic symptoms. And for the, and for the herpes viruses, it's also whether it gets reactivated mm -hmm. uh, periodically. And that's a minority of people, even though you know a very large proportion of the population has been infected with herpes simplex virus, for right. instance. It's only a small proportion that gets cold sores. Uh, most people don't. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this control of uh, virus over long periods of time is uh, is different from one person to another. Yeah, no, definitely. You know what I think is really interesting that you mentioned you wrote a, a recent review article on RNA uh, persistence. And in that, and I had already known this, but there are some viruses where they actually do become fragments. So, so one of the issues that I face in this topic is sometimes people will say, that's just a fragment, it's an RNA fragment, but they'll, they'll make it sound like that, does, that it doesn't matter anymore. But what you clarify is there's a mechanism which by certain RNA viruses sort of trim at the end of their genome, a five prime end, and it, it, frag, it causes it's a fragmentation, but it's actually a survival strategy. Right. Can you right. explain that because more? It suppresses the amount of that virus that's being made. Right. And so, yeah, will you so wonder a little bit more? The cell. Okay. I mean, so this is a smart virus strategy yeah. because it doesn't kill the cell. It can stay around. Uh, uh, and so uh, I think that that's, you know, we, we're just beginning to understand those kinds of, uh, of mechanisms. Uh, but yeah. I think they're probably pretty common. Agreed. That it seems like there's a whole amazing area of research that I agree. I sort of hope the COVID pandemic sparks where 
we understand DNA virus, the way they go in and out of latency. Uh, there's been a lot of research on that. There just seems like so much possibility to better understand those nuances with RNA viruses. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Cool. Does your lab, what is your lab working on now? Are you going to do some work with SARS-CoV-2 or? Well, we have, uh, okay. although not a lot. I mean, uh, <laughs> I think all virologists began working on yeah. SARS-CoV-2 when the uh, pandemic started for more than one reason. First of all, interesting disease. Mm -hmm. Second of all, there were a lot of people that were infected and and uh, in a lot of places, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins is where I am, but they organized a collection of samples from patients, so they were available for study. Uh, and also, they shut down our labs yes. and told us that we couldn't work unless we were working on SARS-CoV-2. So, yes. so the solution to that problem was clear. You just start working on SARS-CoV-2. Yep. And so, yes, we, we did. We've done some, but, uh, but that's uh, we've pretty much gone back now to uh, working on it, it's become a kind of a cro uh, crowded field of uh, yes. SARS-CoV-2 investigators. Um, so it's uh, true, although not that many persistent. I mean, there are. No. We need a lot of persistence researchers, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, when you know, with SARS-CoV-2, if even if your lab isn't doing it that much, what do you think are some of the best ways to approach this topic? So, for example. We, I want to, let's say we want to know if someone with long COVID still has SARS-CoV-2 RNA and antigen, we can do, we can try to do biopsy studies and get some tissue samples and see if we could find the RNA right. and right. antigen. People have done that. We could do autopsy yeah. research, um, animal model studies. And in that sense, you've done some animal model work. How would you approach that with SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, well, the animal models that, that we, well, we've worked with mice, uh, with the alpha viruses, obviously, but uh, for measles, uh, even though our original observations were in children with measles, it soon became clear that uh, answering the questions that we had would require an animal model. Uh, so limited yeah. things you could do with very small yeah. <laughs> African children. So yeah. um, we uh, so we we study monkeys, um, a, a rhesus macaque model for measles because mm -hmm. they get. They get measles just that looks just like human measles mm -hmm. and recover and uh, mm -hmm. from infection, etc. Um, so, so what we have done with the SARS uh, and uh, just kind of trying to get ideas. One one of the things that we observed in our monkeys is that uh, that this persistent RNA, which for measles is primarily in lymphoid tissue, so in lymph nodes, which is where the immune response is generated. And uh, one of the pieces of evidence that there's an ongoing stimulation of the immune response with the uh, that is correlates with the RNA that is being expressed in lymphoid tissue is that there's a continuous production of these germinal centers that make antibody and make antibody secreting yeah. cells. And that if you look in the blood of those same animals, um, you find a continuous production of antibody secreting cells, which normally are, are fairly brief uh, period of time where you find those in the blood. But this, uh, this continued production was basically indicative of this germinal center uh, of what was going on in the lymph nodes, basically. And so, so we have done some of that kind of thing with uh, with uh, uh, with COVID, um, just because uh, you can look and see is there are a long term production or is it short, uh, uh, which would indicate there is you know the, the stimulation for the immune system it occurs over a fairly brief period of time or does it occur over a long period of, uh, of time? So uh, for our lab, that was a relatively straightforward and <laughs> kind of, of uh, uh, way to look, at least get an idea of yeah. that. And, and the answer is that um, at least certainly with people who've been hospitalized with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, 
that they do continue to produce these antibody secreting cells over months. Uh, uh, so that uh, there, I think there is indication that there is ongoing stimulation of the mm -hmm. uh, immune system uh, after apparent recovery, because mm -hmm. most of these people, so, so now you could do the same kind of thing with uh, long COVID. I, yeah. don't know what you'd find but right. but that would be a, that would that would be a logical kind of thing to do i would think um Definitely. but it's certainly looking in tissues i think that um i don't know that that COVID, I, I don't i don't know exactly where i think the covid would be most likely to be uh, a persistent uh where that rna would be most likely to be persistent uh, yeah. and and you know certainly there are autopsy studies that have been done that i assume people are looking but uh, uh which would make sense but uh, i'm not sure it's in lymphoid tissue uh that uh it, there isn't that much tropism for, uh, right. for maybe for monocytes, but not for lymphocytes. Measles replicates in lymphocytes and loves yeah. lymphocytes. So that's not true for COVID. And, and it's more epithelial infection. So right. my suspicion is that it's in the GI tract, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but that's just a suspicion. But that's where I'd look <laughs> if I were looking. Glad to hear it because, yeah, we actually are just about to start a study with a team at Mount Sinai where we're going to get uh, colonoscopy, tish, intestinal tissue from long COVID patients uh, via colonoscopy right. and look for a virus antigen and a number of other just use, you know, some technologies to understand the immune response near possibly identified RNA, also the host gene expression to try to better understand not just if the RNA and the antigen are there, but how the immune system in the human genes in simple terms are, are uh -huh. acting around around the virus. So we all we do think that intestine is a, a is a likely site because SARS-CoV-2 gets into the gut fairly easily, unfortunately. Um, in patients. Um, we're also doing a study of lung tissue um, that seems that makes really sense. straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure there's, there was a, a team, Daniel Cherto led um, an NIH autopsy study. And I, the study is still a preprint, although I think it's getting close to publication. And, and that preprint was called SARS-CoV-2 infection throughout the body and brain. And <laughs> they found, yeah, they found RNA and, and antigen and actually subgenomic messenger RNA, which how do you feel, feel about that? Do you think? Yeah, I don't know. People seem to, uh, you know, that what's been published is that that's most consistent with ongoing replication right. uh, to find the uh, such a genomic RNA. Um, so uh, that may be true. Um, right. It also may be that uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I don't doubt what people have uh, what have people have published, but I would just caution people to think that those RNAs may be produced in more abundance. That's then uh, it, 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 that's true for the alpha viruses, for instance. Yeah. That we're much more likely to find uh, subgenomic RNA than our than full length RNA, but it's also produced at you know ten times the amount. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, the way the replication is, so that it, it may be that. Uh, but uh, yeah, see, this is why we need you. Help with so many decades of RNA experience guiding teams because you understand these really these nuances that are that are not not understood by a lot of people actually. Um, yeah, so the, in that study, he, that team found RNA. Yeah, the the name of the paper just nails it in in so many body sites, also in the in the brainstem and cerebellum in the in the central nervous system, which is not that surprising. So we'll see how those that kind of study replicates, but that that sort of seemed like proof of concept that the virus and the RNA can persist in quite a few sites, probably. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, although one of the interesting things I thought um, about uh, some autopsy studies that have been done with Ebola, actually mainly mm -hmm. with, uh, with primates, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have a much more controlled situation, is that, that, um, that they would seek clearance in some organs you know they wouldn't find rna but then there were other organs which yeah. were you know the testes the eyes the brain etc were yeah. places where they would continue to find it so that this clearance process may be different right. in different organs uh, but yeah. uh, yeah, that's another just another interesting uh, feature definitely no i'm sure that that's that's i think the first step of some of the research now has just been 
can we find SARS-CoV-2 RNA and antigen right. in the body right. or brain? And the next phase, I hope, of research is going to be along those which areas where which where's clearance more quick, you know. Again, and that does involve animal model studies to a point because that's that's where you can actually you know understand the dynamics of the infection instead of just finding. But the ad advantage of studying people is that those are the ones that are getting long COVID. It's I know. really hard to model long. COVID uh, in an animal. Uh, I mean, you can model persistence, I'm sure. Right. Uh, but most people work with inbred animals, and uh, I know, and and, uh, and they can't complain about fatigue or I know. headaches or <laughs> any of the things that people with long COVID do. Um, I know. I agree that it's. I've always thought about that. Is how do you? Because my my boyfriend did a lot of, of mouse research, and you know, as you know, they put them on a wheel and see are they running yeah. as fast. But it, yeah, I agree, it's really hard to correlate some of that behavior to to long COVID symptoms. So why you can maybe use it as an inference, I think that the study of, of SARS CoV two persistence is going to have to combine um, the human tissue studies with the autopsy studies with the animals. So it, we're just going right. to get different facets of information from these that hopefully give us a, a bigger collective picture um, right. with knowing and, the limitations of each. Right. Of each and have, uh, you know, good controls where yep. you uh, are comparing yep. two groups that are fairly well characterized yes. or at least two groups. Be more yes. <laughs> no, definitely. Definitely. You know, okay. Then uh, almost last question with, with your experience of, of RNA persistence, one of the big topics in long COVID, because there have been teams now that have found SARS-CoV-2 RNA um, or antigen in symptomatic long COVID patients at months in tissue samples, one in even stool sample, there was a Stanford right. study that patients, some patients were still shedding RNA in stool. So the, the next obvious thing, and patients want this, and I don't blame them, um, and so do researchers, is antiviral clinical trials in long COVID. So for example, can we trial Paxlovid in long COVID? Can we trial some of the antivirals being used in acute COVID? But I guess, do you think, and I'm not sure that there's a perfect answer to this question, do you think that once a virus has persisted in an RNA form and possibly gotten snuck into, you know, I don't know, it's doing some of its stuff, like we said, to embed itself sort of in cells and make the cells live longer. Do we think that that's going to be those, it's going to be harder to target with something like Paxlovid? Do we think that it's going to work or? I don't know. I know. <laughs> and it's a, we've, we've done, we just completed a study of uh, treating monkeys with measles uh, mm -hmm. with remdesivir uh, mainly which is what's been used uh, yeah. one of the drugs that's used uh, for uh, uh, COVID mm -hmm. um, and the so the question we were asking is does if you treat early and so this yes. is treating but you know this would be treating like after exposure uh, mm -hmm. I mean this is two or three days after the monkeys are infected well before before they get the rash which is about two weeks after mm -hmm. they're infected um, <clears throat> it does look like there's a um, more rapid clearance of the RNA in those animals and now they're treated for 12 days I mean the, it was a fairly extensive treatment mm -hmm. The suppressed virus replication during that acute right. uh, period of time, but even though the the uh, the virus comes back as soon as you stop the drug, sort of like the uh, that people are seeing with uh, 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 with uh, the with the short term treatment uh, uh, Paxlovid for, rebound Paxlovid, yes for yeah. uh, uh, for SARS CoV two it, it it comes back. But then it actually goes away faster than it does in the other animals that didn't get treatment. So we're very interested in looking at the immune response. Is it yeah. that kind of matter <laughs> or, yes. or not <laughs> as, as evidence that uh, this ongoing uh, RNA stimulation is important for uh, yeah. the, the continued stimulation of the immune system? Yes, definitely. It seems like maybe it maybe just getting ahead of things, but it might require cocktails of different drugs. Oh yeah, no, at, right. And some of them actually even modulating the immune system to sort of clear right. Right. RNA right. as yeah. opposed to one. I have, I have to say though, that when we treated, so we did two studies, we won this early uh, treatment 
Uh, and the other was to wait and treat at the time that the monkeys developed a rash. So when you would first mm -hmm. recognize somebody with, with measles, that made absolutely no difference. Ah. Interesting. <laughs> ah. so, uh, so to your point that maybe once you get all those cells infected uh then actually getting rid of the virus is uh is tougher uh yeah I bet it's a it challenge. Like what really happened treating early was you prevented the spread right uh, exactly and, uh, yeah so it seems that with long covid there's and a lot of people talk about this if when we're talking about treatment, they'll probably be the therapeutics you can use before or during acute infection to try right. to prevent, prevent the virus right. from spreading or, yeah. you know, persisting or getting into a growing number of cell types in the first right. place. And then those that are also attempted once someone already harbors uh, viral right. RNA, albeit right. it gets a little hard if it's in the, a neuron, maybe yeah. well, we'd have to come up with a number of approaches, although it seems like a a, a worthwhile challenge so yeah well, there are enough people you know it's it it can be studied the people that did get in fact did get treated it didn't get treated i would yep. think about it will eventually know whether that actually prevents long COVID or not well i think I we already know that it doesn't prevent it but whether it decreases decreases the, it yeah. yeah no that's going to be one thing because yeah the only thing that i I do worry about is I hope that what doesn't happen with long COVID is is someone does a Paxlovid clinical trial and then people don't benefit, you know, there's no benefit, let's say, in the long COVID patients and people say, well, no, their RNA persistence doesn't matter anymore. And I think that the, my takeaway would be, oh, these RNA viruses are pretty sneaky. I right. bet you they they didn't necessarily completely succumb to the Paxlovid. Right. So that's just something that I think the I hope the community keeps in mind. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Well, um, yeah. Do you have any other thoughts then? Um, you know, I, yeah. And any of these topics, whether it's long COVID or RNA virus persistence, any lessons for other researchers? <laughs> well, you, know, you have to look. <laughs> yeah. Look. And, and, uh, and uh, not assume that you know what's going on. And, uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. And you know, quickly. Keep an open mind. <laughs> yeah, quickly, as long as one more question. How did you get into this topic? Because it was, as, it, as I say, it was, it was by accident to try yeah. to understand. Well, I mean, I've been studying viruses for a long time because I was just very interested in how viruses yeah. cause disease. Yeah. But then that's also how you recover from viruses. And so right. okay. the first virus that we were studying were these alpha viruses yeah. that infect neurons. And yeah. How do you get rid of the virus from a neuron? Uh, so yeah. it, it's okay. following my wow. nose, I guess. <laughs> that makes sense because yeah, there's you know there's so little there's such a small field really with RNA virus persistence. I've never really met anyone who says I'm going into RNA virus persistence nope. as nope. much as people who nope. just exactly arrive at it via their other experiments right. or something yeah. like that. No, no, so. no. We just. Uh, I won't say stumbled on it, but discovered right. it in trying to understand what was going on. That makes sense. Cool. All right. Well, it's really good to talk with you. Um, thank you for, you know, I recommend that people read your last paper um, okay. about, it's a 2022 okay. paper. Um, there's so much, it's it's very well written. And it's, it's straightforward to read and you explain so many mechanisms by which the RNA, um, persistent RNA is able to... <laughs> Sort of interact with the immune system in ways that that are really fascinating it's just a fascinating paper so thank you okay you're welcome cool all right, all right. Bye. bye